this evening, I ask that you'll use your imagination a little bit with me here in the beginning as we travel back in time. Now, you can close your eyes if you'd like to. People won't know that you're asleep because I've asked you to close your eyes if you'd like to. Just actually don't fall asleep and it'll be okay. It's the year 30 BC, near the time of Jesus' ministry. We're in Palestine. There's a lot of sand and dirt and rock. It's hot during the day but, cur but turns cool at night, something we don't really know about here. It's very late, around midnight. There's a small stone house with one door and one window off in the distance, and the only one that's glowing with light. They must be burning that midnight oil. As we take a closer look inside, we see the children fast asleep in the family bed, the mother sitting at the end of the elevated platform mending an old robe by the light of a lantern. The father is at the door leading in the livestock in for the night. And all of a sudden, he hears someone calling out his name in the distance, a familiar voice piercing the cool, still, moonlit air. And as the father squints, he's able to see a man waving his hands in the air, and he wonders, could this be my friend who's coming down the road? The father quickly waves back, and then with a big grin, then goes inside and says, wife, uh-oh, our good friend is coming down the road, but we have no bread to share with him. So I'm going to run next door and borrow some from our neighbors, since they always have bread left over at the end of the day. Now, a little aside, you see there's two Jewish laws going on of hospitality here in these verses. The man with a visitor must provide generously to his newly arrived friend, and the neighbor must help another with a request, even for bread at a late hour. So the father slams the door, he waves to his good friend who's coming down the road, and then disappears around the house, going towards a neighbor's door. As the father's running, I can imagine what's going through his head. Oh no, there's no lights on anywhere. Everyone is probably fast asleep. If I wake him up, he'll most, most likely wake up the rest of the family in the bed. He'll have to trip over all the goats and the sheep and the cows that are sleeping on the floor. He's not going to want to get up and assist me with this request. And he finally reaches the neighbor's door and knocks firmly three times. Don't bother me. A voice from inside says, the door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. Again, the father knocks three more times. As he leans in towards the door, he hears some huffing, some grumbling, as a neighbor stumbles around in the dark, looking for a, his lamp and some matches. And all of a sudden, he sees some glow coming from under the door. The fire's been lit. And he thinks, I'm saved. My neighbor has gotten up. So the neighbor opens a door, and the father quickly but politely asks, can I please borrow three small loaves of bread? For my friend is just now coming to my house, and I have nothing to give him. The neighbor agrees and tiredly fetches three loaves of bread. And then the father races back to the house, wondering if his friend has finally arrived. And as he turns the corner, approaching the front door, he sees his friend standing there and greets him with wide open arms, full of bread. And the father takes a deep breath and says, My friend, won't you come in and have some bread? And then we all break out in song that can you feel the love tonight you know that song right the lion king feeling the love the love of the father because this is all what jesus story is all about feeling the love of god in this evening's gospel lesson before jesus uses this comparison to reinforce how great the father's love is he gives to his disciples a simple prayer 
a prayer that they can pray habitually, the prayer being known to us as the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive one another who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, I'll only touch briefly on this because not so long ago, Father Joe had a great sermon series right after his sabbatical all about the Lord's Prayer. So just a wee bit on the Lord's Prayer. We begin by addressing our Father, our Father God who is in heaven, who is the creator of all things, who loves us more than anything. Then we acknowledge that he is holy, that he is set apart, bringing glory to his name by giving him the reverence due. And only after we put God first, we pray for our present needs, saying, give us today our daily bread. And pray for our past sins, saying, Father, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And then we pray for our future trials, saying, and do not bring us into the time of trial. Now, just as Israel, back in the book of Exodus, chapter 16, you have to look at it later, had to gather up the manna God provided for them each and every day while wandering in the desert, that they would learn to rely on him and him alone. Jesus gives to his disciples and all of us a prayer designed to be used each and every day. Praying for things happening, praying for things and people upon our hearts, praying that we would not fall into temptation this day, but instead live for him moment by moment, situation by situation. This is the prayer of open hands and open hearts, asking God to move and, and, and act in and among us every moment of the day as we seek to be his hands and his feet. Now, in this weekend's gospel lesson, not only does Jesus teach us how to pray, but he also teaches us about prayer. And that's where I want to linger for a little bit. So stay with me. When I first read this parable, my initial inclination was to think that Jesus is simply using the story to tell us to be persistent in our prayers, as little Bree is persistent in trying to open the cabinets under the counter. But it's not about that kind of persistence. We're not to, we're not to batter at the Lord's door, as it were. But he is using this parable of the friend to, to help his disciples to see above all else that it's about coming to him, coming to him, coming to the Lord with whatever request we have, whenever, wherever, with a kind of persistence, because just as their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, loves them and wants to give them every good thing, so does the Son of God through the Holy Spirit. So, we are in some sense to come to God with some persistence for a real conversation marked by a real relationship bound by real trust with a real God who would do anything for his children. With that said, scholar William Barclay, one of my favorites, reminds us that we are not, again, to batter at the Lord's door. It's not about coercing an unwilling God to act. It's more about having, again, that conversation, taking the time required to have a healthy relationship. For persistence in prayer doesn't change God, but it does change our lives by influencing our hearts and our minds. And it can help us understand and express our urgent needs before the throne of grace. And this is precisely what's happened in my life this last week when I was gone. Nothing earth-shattering, but I thought I'd share it with you. I found myself persistent in my prayers, not again battering at the Lord's door, but about coming to him repeatedly as I went off to my retreat, having Kate and, and Bree sniffling and sneezing and coughing, and I was starting to feel that myself. And I said, God, I don't want this. Take it from me. And I started, as I was driving up to Jacksonville, I started laying hands on my sinuses and on my chest, asking the Lord to take whatever I had 
that was beginning to come away because I didn't want to go to my retreat coughing on my neighbor or having to miss it because I got so sick. And, you know, it wasn't an immediate thing, but I saw every day that I prayed, I felt better. And I never actually got what Kate and Bree have still at this moment. I kept on praying each and every day, sometimes a couple of times a day, and God was good. He heard my prayers, and I didn't end up getting that nasty cold. Now, if you run into Bree or Kate, I don't think they're here this evening, but if you run into them, you will see that they're still sniffling and sneezing and coughing. They haven't gotten through their colds, even though I've been praying for them as well. Now, does that mean that God heard my own personal prayers for me and acted upon them, but not my prayers for others? Or was it more about teaching me to continually come back to the Father, that I would experience his love for us, who desires all people to be free? This, brothers and sisters, is really what our Bible story is about. Truly less about persistence and more about seeking and finding the love and graciousness of our Father. As, again, Barclay puts it, if an unwilling neighbor can be coerced into getting out of bed to give a persistent neighbor bread for his guest, how much more will God, who is a loving Father, give to all his children what they truly need and desire? In prayer, we go to our Father in heaven who knows our needs before we can even ask. If we don't get what we ask for in our prayers, it doesn't mean that God is grudgingly refusing to give us what we desire. The truth is, he always has something better for us in store than we'll ever know. It's about being in a relationship with a God who loves us more than anything who wants us to be free and whole and and, and, and joy-filled balls of light in this world around us. And all we have to do is pray. Really pray. Come to him and pray. But that's the rub, isn't it? We must continue, continue to come back to our God. Asking, seeking, knocking, awaiting God's answer. As the saying goes, good things come to those who wait. And in our family's case, I know God heard my prayers. As I saw Kate and Bree both get a little better, a little more peace, a little more at ease when they were sleeping at night after I prayed. Did he heal them on the spot? No. They were still goopy and hacking and all that kind of stuff. So again, my prayers seem to help over here, but not really help over here. But the fact of the matter is, beloved, is that we kept on praying, and we kept on doing it together. It brought us together, and it blessed us in other ways. More and more, as we were living into the assurance that Jesus was hearing our prayers, as he always acts out of an immense love for us and always has our best interest in the forefront of his mind and how he acts. And that's really what it's about, is learning to come back around and around and around, back to him time and time again for our daily bread, for all that we need for sustenance and well-being in this life. So keep praying. Keep offering yourselves up unto the Lord with open hands. Keep seeking the goodness and the love of God and be bold in your prayers, even if it's just for a little cold. Lay your hands, ask God to do a mighty work and to heal you. Because simply, beloved, he loves us and he wants the best for us.